In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel text this morning from John chapter 1 is a very rich text that explains who Christ is, what he came to do, and how he is full of grace for you and for me. And who can forget the beautiful language of John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then that last verse in our reading this morning, verse 14 of John 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the Christian message right there. That's the Christmas message. The Word became flesh. And this is undoubtedly why this text, John 1, was chosen for Christmas Day, that last verse, verse 14, the Word became flesh. This is speaking of the Son of God who became a man in the womb of the Virgin Mary. God has become a man for you and for me. Now this rich language in John 1 here has been misused over the centuries by false teachers, and this is how it always is with them. They hardly abuse passages of Scripture that give simple information. Oh, Joshua went here and conquered this tribe and then went here and did this. They abuse the passage of Scripture that clearly portray and preach Jesus Christ and grace through faith and salvation by God's great love for us in Christ. Those are the passage, passages that they really abuse and where they really go to work. And so you have Arius, that ancient uh, false teacher, he used this text, John 1, to say, see, see, John 1, Jesus was not really God. Oh, sure, he had some divine status, but he wasn't on equal status with God the Father. He was separate from God. He was with God, right? He's not God himself. So let's go through our text, friends, carefully, that we might understand it properly, that we might learn to rebuke the false teachers and learn great things, the great things that God has done for us in Christ. And don't, don't think in your heart, so, oh, Pastor, we don't need to learn the really heavy-duty stuff. We don't really need to learn how to debate with Arius. Just, just preach us the simple gospel. But that would be a, a, an unfortunate thing for you to think. It would be a silly thing to think. In that case, we might as well just boil the whole scriptures down to John 3.16 and just cut everything else out. Let's just, Jesus died for you, believe in him, and that's it. Well, Luther didn't think that way. He gave credence to those preachers who could preach a simple gospel message, and he called them, well, they can preach Easter but they can't preach the rest of the church here. We have to get into some heavy-duty stuff. We have to think about the mystery of the Blessed Holy Trinity. Uh, don't uh, think uh, of heavy-duty stuff uh, as something that you don't need to know. That would be like telling your mechanic, oh, just fix my car, but don't bother looking under the hood and the engine. Just, just fix it. Well, you have to get under the engine. You have to get into the nitty-gritty. So here is the first... Uh, words in our gospel text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. These are simple words, but the import of them is profound. And John is calling our attention back to the very beginning, Genesis 1-1, where there's a very similar introduction. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John is clearly wanting you to to think about Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, you have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and then you have God speaking. You have God giving the word, saying things like, that there be light and there was light. And so notice how John is saying with John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. To put it another way, John is saying, look, the Word was not created. It was already there in the beginning. Jesus, who is the Word made flesh, has always existed as the Son of God. 
He has existed since eternity past. This is deep, heady stuff. But it's the stuff that thankfully the church has wrestled with and got right and so confessed in the Nicene Creed. Who is Jesus after all? We need to get him right. We don't want to get him wrong. Salvation is at stake. Now, John also said the word was with God. That means there's, there's some distinctiveness between the word and God the Father. But then to avoid misunderstanding and to curb the heretics, John goes on to say the word was God, thus making the word distinct from God, making the Son distinct from the Father. And yet, as to put it in the words of the nice cream, they were of the same substance. Aha. Uh -huh. The same material, if you will. There's distinctiveness between the Father and Son, but then there's some sameness, if you will. And so John is beginning to help us grasp the mystery and wonder of the blessed Holy Trinity. There's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. Three in one, three distinct persons, one divine essence, one divine substance. And John is careful to point out that this Christ is much more than what people had heard about him. Remember the debate back in the early days of Christianity wasn't, was Jesus human? Everybody knew that. Here's this carpenter from Nazareth. Oh, yes, and he did great miracles. The question was, who is this man? Why was he able to do these things? Is he God? And John is emphatically saying, yes, he was with God in the beginning. Now, our, the next words in our gospel text are these, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men the light shines in darkness and the darkness has not overcome it you could also tr uh, uh, translate that the darkness has not extinguished it um, here john explains that jesus it, it has to be equated with the very creator of the universe this isn't some sub god some semi-divine god jesus wasn't seven eighths god and uh, you know, at eighth knot, and he wasn't a little bit below God the Father. No, he is to be equated with the very creator of the universe. Everything was made through him. And so far then, these words are, are a little bit startling, a little bit frightening. If Jesus is God, then we better pay attention to him. I recall a friend of my wife and I's who was dabbling, he was not a Christian, dabbling with matters of the Christian faith, was impressed by Jesus. But he revealed, he says, but I just can't quite figure out, is he God or not? Who, who, he did great things, wonderful example of piety, but is he God? Well, John is saying to us, yes, he is God, and we need to listen to him. And I think that this man probably was hung up because if he concluded that Jesus was God, okay, then you need to read the red letters in your Bible and you better pay attention. And, and we, this is a little bit of a sad note for us all because we're quick to listen to those who can afflict us with physical suffering, our bosses at work, the policemen, but how slow we are to listen to God and pay attention to his word, the one who can afflict us with eternal suffering. But then John, here's where the gospel starts to come through. John begins to explain how this Christ, this son of God, this divine word, was the life and light of men. Okay. We need to pay attention to this Jesus but the good news isn't that he's come with divine authority. That not so much. It's that he has come to bring us light and life. Hallelujah. And this is the meaning of Christmas. The Son of God came to this earth for the good of all mankind, to bring us life where there's death, to bring us light where there's darkness. Hallelujah. In the words of the message last night, the Son of God came to defeat the devil for us. 
And this good news uh, is really uh, impossible for us to grasp without the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and part of that is, by nature, we just don't think we need saving. We don't think we're in the darkness. We think we're just doing fine, that we have light enough on our own. And again, for most people, the only saving they think they need is to get out of financial debt or bad health. The Lord only is interesting to them if he helps them get better, helps them get out of debt. But we have to think differently about Jesus. We need real saving. We poor sinners need a real Savior that saves us from God's wrath. That's the first saving we need. Last night I emphasized the saving that we needed from Satan. But we need saving from God himself. And only God could save us from himself. And this Christ has done all that. He is truly the real Savior in the light of all mankind. Now, John says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This is emphasizing Christ's victory over evil against the devil and so on. And then the next words in our gospel text is where John is, the apostle is speaking about John the Baptist. And he says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And this is important to recognize the importance of John the Baptist, the great preacher who pointed people to Christ. And this, again, is where we can learn great material about what Christian preachers today should be doing. They, too, bear witness about the light. They're, they exist, and their office exists to point people to the Christ, that they might believe in him. Beware, then, of the preacher who likes to tell jokes and stories and make you laugh. He's no John the Baptist. Such a preacher is unable to lead people to heaven. Preachers today need to be like John, willing to suffer, willing to preach repentance, but willing to say, look, this is the one you need to believe in, Jesus Christ. Our gospel text continues, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. And here we learn uh, important things, important doctrine. Jesus is the true light for everyone. He's the only Savior for all of mankind. There is no such thing as different saviors for different people. Christianity is for everyone. Luther's small catechism is what everybody should believe in and hold dear. But the world will tell you that there are many paths to God. And this is what Liberal Christianity and the Roman Church even teaches do too. Both preach that Jesus is not really the only Savior. They preach that if you try hard to be good, that is good enough. But that isn't good enough. Trying hard to be good will get you nowhere with God. He must do it all for you. And so we have preachers out there, preachers on television, preachers who fill the bookstores with their own books, who fail miserably at imitating John and bearing witness to the Christ. And we have to recognize that and reject such teaching and preaching and learn to cling to the faithful preacher like who imitates John and preaches the true light, Jesus Christ. And friends, here let me boast a little bit about our Savior's Lutheran. And here we can 
do due diligence in just inviting people to church. Come hear about this Jesus that pastor speaks about. Come hear about this Jesus who brings light and life into the darkest places. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good here at our Savior's Lutheran. And the great and sad irony of the gospel uh, and church history that John indicates in, in John 1 is that the Jews did not, as a whole, receive the Christ. The text says it. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And preachers need to get used to this. You can preach the finest of messages, and people are going to reject it. Don't be one of them, right? Our gospel text closes with these words, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And here John brings our attention back to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the pre-incarnate Word. He's the second person of the blessed Holy Trinity. And he brings us again into that place where we can contemplate the great wonderful mystery of the incarnation that God has become a man and has lived with us sinners. And this is condescension in the good sense. This is hard for us Americans to understand where we don't have distinct classes, this idea of someone of high standing, of high importance, stooping down to help someone of lower standing. But this is the gospel. God stooping down to become like one of us, poor, miserable sinners, in order to redeem us. And we just sang it in our, in our hymn, verse 2. Come from on high to me, I cannot rise to thee. Thank, praise God for good hymn writers who preach texts like John 1 to us. And John's careful to document that he was an eyewitness to this gracious condes condescension. He was an eyewitness of Jesus' miracles, yes, but he witnessed his death and his resurrection that we too might believe and then have our own resurrection. And Jesus is, or John is careful to spell out th that Christ means God's grace and truth. And through faith in him, we're attached to the truth, we're attached to Christ, and it means our own glory with God the Father in heaven. What good news and what preciousness that God has left us with his holy scriptures that we might hear about Jesus Christ, God become flesh, for you and for we, me, that we might believe and be saved. Rejoice with me. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.